than a wicked and hip hop. Bad, bad, and a wicked and So it's actually uh, the, uh, I think that the last course with actual uh, technical content, right? Cause the, but for this course, cause uh, there will be a Thanksgiving uh, holiday on Wednesday, and then uh, we have the guest lecture next Monday and then the final review, right? So uh, this is actually uh, the uh, last, the actual topic we're going to discuss this, this, in this course. Hopefully you have been uh, enjoying it so far. So uh, there are actually quite some administrative stuff um, for today's class. The first, of, of course, um, I mean, the last homework will be released today and is due on December the 2nd. And probably uh, more importantly, uh, project four, the last project is going to due on Sunday, December the 5th. And I think we have, I think the TA has posted uh, on Piazza the uh, time about the recitation, right? I think that's tomorrow. And then also very importantly, <laughs> Uh, next Monday, we'll have the guest lecture uh, from um, Google Big BigQuery uh, to uh, deliver a lecture in this course. And for this, we're actually going to uh, uh, require attendance because Google is actually a sp sponsor in this class for many of the course development, etc. So actually, uh, we would need everyone to uh, participate uh, in the guest lecture and we'll uh, uh, require attendance there. And I actually post uh, more details about how do we uh, count that. But uh, that's, uh, that's, the, that's next week. And then for the final exam, it will be on a fr Friday, December the 10th. It will be uh, 8.30 in the morning. And also we actually uh, didn't get assigned with this room again. So we actually will go to uh, uh, Dota Hall on uh, uh, 2010, right? So this is actually uh, different from this room. Just be mindful of that. And then similar uh, to the midterm, we'll actually be um, using something like a Scantron. Essentially, we'll use a grid scope to scan all your exams and then grade that uh, using the auto, using the assistance of their auto grading uh, method, so uh, you 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 should actually bring uh, pencils and rubbers right, to make sure that you only have answers uh, that you want to select. Right, if you you didn't have a pencil and you pick something and you select something and then later on uh, trying to cancel it and then select another thing, it's very easy to uh, get your uh, question grade graded uh, incorrectly. Right, so uh, please remember to bring a pencil and a rubber for the exam. And it's, again, it's in a different uh, classroom, so be mindful for that. All right. So uh, for the upcoming uh, talks, uh, on, again, uh, right after this uh, class, we actually have uh, Dreamu come to talk about uh, their query optimization technique, and then also uh, on Tuesday, right? It's like uh, it's I, for some reason the display is not correct on the screen, but on on Tuesday we actually have uh, the same person that will give a guest lecture on Monday to talk about a little bit more like researchy stuff about Google uh, BigQuery. Right? On Tuesday it's actually a uh, P, uh, PDL talk. That, for that, I mean, if you're interested, you can attend, but we we don't uh, require attendance for that, right? even though it's it's the same person, right? All right. So a little bit of recap about uh, last class before we uh, jump into uh, today's content. <laughs> so last class we talked about uh, how do we uh, really uh, handle the uh, distributed transactional database, right? To uh, deal with those uh, distributed transactions. And especially we talk about uh, different uh, commit protocols, like the more commonly used two-phase commit, as well as um, uh, Paxos or Raft, when you have more failures in your cluster, you can also consider, right? We talk about the different uh, design decisions when you're trying to replicate your data, synchronous, asynchronous, etc. Especially we have the concept of uh, strong consistency versus eventual, eventual consistency, right? For strong consist uh, consistency, you actually uh, have to make, make sure that all your replica has received and propagated the changes for a particular record before you go back to the client to say that you have commit, right? So that other users, when it come to any replica, it will read the same value. But for eventual consistency, uh, you only need to uh, make sure that change is, is uh, that the change exists on the primary or the, or the master uh, copy or the node of your data, right? Then you can tell the client that you have successfully committed, and then eventually, right, uh, the change will propagate to other replicas. But during this time, others may read a, a inconsistent uh, version of the data. That's called eventual consistency. And we also uh, put these concept, uh, concepts into the context of uh, CAP theorem, and specifically uh, for the three properties in the CAP theorem, consistency uh, available as, as a partition tolerant, 
there's just no way you can satisfy all three of them all the, at, the, at the same time in a distributed system. Right? At most, you can satisfy two of them. <laughs> and lastly, we mentioned a little bit about federated database, which means that if your organization or company right, already have different applications and built maybe by different teams at the different times, uh, and then using different database, right? So you can also use this sort of like a, kind of like a middleware technique, try to glue different uh, distributed or distrib different database uh, systems together, right? As if they are a single uh, distributed database, so that you can get uh, easier access uh, and uh, processing of your data. All right. So that's all for our last class. So uh, before I jump into uh, today's lecture, I'm not sure whether you uh, whether you have seen this picture from Andrew's earlier lectures before, but essentially uh, the uh, typical setup right for a modern data application will actually have a, will be actually kind of, kind of like this uh, two side setup, right? So you will have many of these uh, OLTP databases. Uh, like I discussed last class, right, to handle the uh, modifications to the data. For example, if you're Amazon, you have um, uh, different uh, phone apps, right, that, uh, that users would order uh, uh, products, all these uh, sellers, like selling their products, or you have other uh, applications, right, either on your laptop or your website, have different places that generate those data, but then those are at fast speed, right, these like kind of transactional, like have short access and modification of the data. <laughs> and then, when you want to uh, perform analytics on those data, right? Trying to look at those data, trying to figure out, hey, whether there's some interesting uh, trend or knowledge that I, I can extract from the data to help out, help out my business, then typically you will actually put them in a single location first, right? To have this like unified place that store all the data so that you can uh, perform, analyze on them, maybe join different uh, data sources together and then uh, extract knowledge out of it, right? So in the middle step, middle step usually uh, there's some uh, software to do the uh, data extraction, data transformation, as well as loading the data out of those OLTP databases and then put into this uh, central location called OLAP databases for analytical purpose, right? So that's kind of actually a typical uh, data pipeline you will see in the modern applications. And uh, I mean, uh, uh, one question is that why there's OLTP and OLAP side? Well, as you can see probably uh, in today's lecture, there are actually uh, different properties, right? Different optimization goals that the different systems has. Right. For example, for OLAP, OLTP database, like what we discussed last course, they are focusing on make sure that the distributed transactions are executed correctly and efficiently. Right? You can modify data and commit records in a fast fashion. But then on the right, for the OLAP database, which in short for online analytical processing, uh, usually those are read-only queries that, right, that are scanning through lots of lots of data and perform sometimes complicated operation to extract the knowledge and the intelligence out of it. Right? So this is like a very different type of query. So you may potentially need a different type of system optimization. And then there are the, there's like a two different um, type of systems uh, coexist in a data application. All right? So, uh, like I said, uh, those, I mean, I mean, sometimes this uh, OL analytical processing system will actually be also be called a decision support system, data warehousing, right? And sometimes, uh, nowadays, they also have the name of a data lake. I mean, even though someone may argue that data lake actually contains more data, right? More data formats, potentially. Uh, but then, essentially, they are a very similar thing. So, sometimes, they are also called a decision support system. And essentially, uh, they are trying to uh, help the organization to analyze, analyze a large amount of data that can generate uh, some sort of like intelligent, uh, intelligent information, right? Like to help uh, the organization to make a decision uh, and help out their business. So before we talk about the implementation detail, so there are actually uh, generally uh, two models that we are going to organize the data in this type of uh, online analytical processing uh, system. So for this class, right, even though we are focusing on database implementation, right, how these join algorithms, right, how this trade-off between uh, different design decisions, uh, but for the purpose of this class, right, in order to understand some of the design decisions made for these uh, analytical processing uh, systems, we also want to talk a little bit about well, after you extract all the data out of those OLTP databases, how you are going to organize those data in the analytical system, right? And there are different choices there and it would impact some of the optimization you would choose, okay? So the two common uh, 
paradigm, if you will, to organize the data would be first star schema, the second snowflake schema. <laughs> so in the star schema, the way to organize their data, right, like uh, again, out of those different sources, but put into the central location, right? So the way to organize those data is that typically you will have a, a single fact table and then lots of uh, dimension tables that is only uh, one level out of the fact table, right? Actually, uh, just uh, one qu quick thing to remind here is that you could, I mean, in theory, you could actually directly take whatever data schema out of your uh, online transaction database, right? Directly copy the schema onto the old database. That's possible, right? But then, in actuality, it's often beneficial to reorganize the, the, your data a little bit, right? To shuffle them uh, and then uh, put into them in a, a unified uh, 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 form or like organization so that the system can query them efficiently, right? Just like a quick comment. <laughs> okay, so back to this uh, star schema. Again, usually one single fact table and then a lot of uh, dimension table, but only in the star schema, we only allow those dimension layer table to be one layer out of the fact table, right? Because like since single like a central, central like a sun, right? Like in the, in the, in the universe and then lots of stars around it. So uh, for the fact table, those are usually uh, records uh, the events generated in your system, right? Again, okay. <laughs> think of an example where uh, you are running the uh, database for this uh, sales for Amazon, right? Then in this case, the fact table would contain all the sales, right? It would be, it would have uh, one row or one record for every single um, purchase of sales made, uh, I mean, in your, in your, on your website. And then uh, this sales table, sorry, <laughs> this fact table would only have a very uh, basic information as well as foreign key references uh, to the dimension table outside. Right? For example, uh, this here in this sales here in this example, the sales table would have um, the foreign keys to the product, to the location, to the customer, as well as some uh, basic information like what's the price and what's the quantity. Right? <laughs> and then only in those dimension table you will have those detailed information. Right. So, for example, for each um, product that is made on the, on every single sale, you may have the category of the product, the product name, the product code, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. So, uh, one benefit of this um, I mean, star schema approach is that the drawing would be uh, relatively simpler. Right. So, in this case. The drawings would be at most, I mean, drawn in two tables, right? Because I mean, there are, there are, oh, maybe, maybe three, but usually uh, there would be only be a one, uh, like a central drawing predicate that connects either a sales uh, against product or sales against, against location, right? So the drawing would typically just be uh, one level. But then because of these restrictions, there could actually be some a redundancy in the in the dimension table as well, right? Because right here, for example, again, just looking at this product table, assuming that there are only like a very few category, right? Category a name, category description, etc. Assuming that there are only like a four or five or six category in the entire system, but then if you only allow one a layer of dimension table, then for every row in the dimension table, you have to copy this information of this category as well, right? Even though at the end of the day, you may only have um, five or six categories. All right, that makes sense? Okay. Then on the contrary, another example would just be called a snowflake schema, right? You, again, you will have a, a central fact table that will record all the events generated in your system, but then you just don't have a limitation on, on, whatever, uh, on whatever how many dimension table you have, right? So you can just uh, do uh, data normalization as, as much as you can. And then in this case here, for example, in the uh, product table, you may recognize that, hey, I have uh, maybe like thousands or tens of thousands of products, but at the end of the day, there are only like five or six type of uh, categories. And then you can just uh, normalize that data and then extract the category information to, the, uh, to, to another table and then re reduce the redundancy. Right? So of course, in this case, you, have, you would store less data, but then the potential issue with that is that you may actually perform, need to perform drawing across uh, multiple tables. Right, so the join join query may be join query may be more complex. Uh, so by the way, that's the Snowflake schema. That's actually where the name of the famous database system Snowflake come from, right? So I mean, there's like a system that recently I think went to IPO last year or something, right? And and obviously, uh, Snowflake system would support this uh, Snowflake schema, and then they have lots of optimization for that, right? Yeah.
So sort of to reiterate uh, the uh, differences uh, between a star uh, schema as a snowflake schema, <laughs> right? So in the uh, snowflake schema, you will uh, do this normalization on data, right? To try to reduce redundancy as much as possible. Uh, but then you uh, potentially have, uh, I mean, as a, as a second issue pointed out, with the snowflake schema, you potentially have to uh, perform drawing on many more tables. Right? So the queries may potentially be more complex. On the contrary, right, with, with the uh, star schema, the drawings would be simpler. Uh, but then when you denormalize the data, right, not only you potentially uh, have the issues of uh, data redundancy, but also sometimes it, it would be difficult to maintain integrity. Right? For example, back to this um, earlier example, right, back to the example with the product, uh, product table, uh, this dimension table called product, if you have lots of lots of copies of the category uh, information on your system, right, you sort of have to ensure that, that all the for, for the category with the same name, they always have the same description, right? Because after, if you do the uh, star schema, if you do the normalization, you, you can easily ensure this information or this property because you only have one entry of uh, the catalog in each catalog lookup table, right? But then in the earlier uh, star schema example, you have to ensure this property by yourself and it's kind of easy to generate uh, uh, inconsistent uh, data in this star schema uh, paradigm. All right, makes sense? Any questions? Okay. So, uh, talk a little bit about uh, these, um, the specific design issues about uh, the distributed on transaction, sorry, analytical uh, database uh, in this class, right? So I want to motivate uh, this uh, discussion with this uh, with simple example, right? Say uh, you have, um, I mean, distributed database, you have uh, four partitions of the data, and then you have a simple drawing query, right? Just, I mean, join in two tables and perform some analytics, but in this case, just uh, get, the, get the value of all the rows on these two tables. So in this case, I mean, for assuming that the query land on the first partition, and it needs data from all the other partition, right? So a naive approach, right? A most naive approach is that, I mean, since this query is I mean, trying to access the data, uh, I mean, all the data among the two tables and then you need to join on them, the most naive approach is just to copy all the data to this um, very first partition and then uh, perform the join there. Right? But obviously, I mean, it's pretty costly to do this because you have to move lots of data around and depending on this, uh, whether there's enough memory on a particular partition, you may also need to uh, put, uh, perform a external uh, join, right? which would be very expensive. So the question is, can we actually uh, do a little bit better than this uh, naive approach? All right, I mean, it would be correct though, All right? So, uh, specifically, we are talking about these uh, four issues uh, in uh, today's uh, lecture. The first is uh, what would be the models uh, for, we, uh, for us to perform these uh, executions in a distributed analytical database. And the second, we will talk a little bit about how we uh, change the query planning uh, in this scenario. And especially, one uh, important thing we need to consider in a distributed uh, analytical uh, query is that just the cost of network. Right, and sending over, sending data over the network would potentially be very costly. So you sort of need to uh, encapsulate that in your cost model. And next, we'll talk about a few algorithms to perform the drawing uh, in a distributed environment. And lastly, right, uh, not specifically uh, related to uh, uh, to uh, analytical processing, but then we will also last uh, conclude with a few examples of the uh, modern cloud system, right, to finish this course. So. First, the uh, fundamental two uh, different models to execute a uh, query, or an especially analytical query, in a distributed system is that either you push the query to the data, or you pull the data to the query, right? So in the first model, when you push query to the data, what it means is that you are just going to send either the, 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 the entire query or a portion of the query to the uh, location where the data exists. Right. And then you're going to try to perform as much processing as possible, right? Say, do some filtering or do some uh, like early processing of the data as much as possible on the location that the data exists before sending the uh, rest of the data to the, um, to the other uh, centralized location, for example, and then aggregate the results, right? And then uh, on the country, the uh, other approach would be a uh, pull data query to the query. Essentially, what it means that I mean, if the query uh, land on a particular uh, machine, but then the data is not there, you're just going to fetch the data to that machine and then perform the computation where the, the query, where, on the location that receives the query. That's the other model. 
So I should say that, uh, so I will give you some example. The first example would be uh, push query to data. But I should say that uh, whether you use a shared nothing or shared disk architecture, that actually, that is independent of what model you use, right? But just for illustration purpose, it's easier for me to uh, illustrate a push query to the data example with a uh, shared nothing example, shared nothing architecture, and then uh, other example would be a different architecture. But, but, uh, but, that, but that's actually independent. Which model you use for execute query is independent of the um, architecture, all right? So here in this case, again, assume that we have a uh, shared nothing architecture, right? The first node would potentially have uh, records with, uh, in the T relation, relation R, relation R with ID 1 to 100, S, uh, Y to 100, and the second node or second partition would have, uh, I mean, records uh, for both R and, R and S with um, ID 101 and to 200, right? So, uh, so for this uh, simple example, Right, uh, select um, star from these two, uh, from the joining result of these two tables. Assuming that um, this uh, query land on the first partition, right, then the first partition only has data 1 to, 100 to 1 to 100, right, then the first partition will actually send a portion of the data, right, which would actually be uh, performing uh, this join on these um, two tables with ID from 101 to 200 to the second node. Right, and the second node will actually receive this like a partial query, and then perform the join and send the results uh, back to the uh, first first uh, node, and then aggregate them together, right, and then send back send the results back to the client. Make sense? Okay. <laughs> so uh, in the uh, second example, right, I pull data to the query. So assuming here we have a uh, shared disk architecture, right? And then, I mean, naturally, uh, those uh, compute nodes just doesn't have any data, right? Because the, the data would all in the, be in the centralized location. So again, the same query, right? So uh, join this join query on RNS. So uh, first compute node would actually have this logical partition that is responsible uh, for computing the results from 100, right? And then <laughs> the second partition Second node would have this logical partition to compute the results 101 to 200, right? But either like, the first node or second node, they don't have any data, right? So in a, in a pool data to the query model, I mean, these two um, uh, nodes, two compute nodes, will send a process request to the uh, centralized, I mean, location, shared location for the data. And then this like uh, centralized uh, shared disk would actually uh, I mean, send all the data to this uh, compute node and then do the computation. And finally, uh, say here, after the computation, the second node, I mean, send the final result again back to the first node and then send back to the client to aggregate them, right? But then the main idea is that this, uh, this compute node needs to pull the data out of this uh, shared centralized location and then perform the computation on like, where this uh, computation is assigned, essentially. That makes sense? Okay, <laughs> so one thing to note here is that I think I also have a related slide later is that, well, obviously it's kind of wasteful, right, if you think about it. So, so here, this query is kind of simple, but say there's some filter on this query with some where clauses, right? So in that case, it might be kind of wasteful if we have to pull all the data from this uh, shared story location to, uh, to the uh, compute node, assuming that, for example, there's some where clause uh, to filter query based on some other properties, values, et cetera, right? So um, some cloud system and some modern uh, shared disk system will actually uh, support some filtering uh, functionalities on this centralized uh, shared uh, storage or shared disk location. Now, Amazon S3 is a famous example. So many of the um, distributed database offering uh, by Amazon in their, in their cloud would actually kind of like, it's not like a cl clean uh, pull data to query or push query to data anymore. Right? So it kind of does do a little bit of both. So it should be a shared disk, but then the storage layer would actually have, would support some simple uh, functionality. Right? For example, you have a simple where clause to filter the data based on the, uh, I don't know, the, the age or the, or the value, et cetera, right? The, the share, even though it's a shared disk environment, it can also perform a little bit simple filtering on this uh, storage uh, layer and then send the other data to the uh, different compute nodes and do the computation, right? So in this case, it's not that clean anymore. It's sort of like doing a little bit of both, all right? So that's some uh, example, a modern example, right? That could like uh, take the benefit of both worlds, if you will, all right? So next, 
The one thing to, to note here is that while a uh, distributed analytical database is like, a, no matter whether it's like a pooling data or push query, but while it is performing those uh, operations, it usually have a, a local copy, right? especially when the data is, is coming from um, other nodes, right? From, for example, from a shared disk or from other partitions, it usually has a, a local copy of this data to perform the computation. But the thing is, I mean, the, usually these data are put into the buffer pool, right? If the, the buffer pool or the memory is not enough, that got spelled on disk. But usually what happens is that system typically don't actually possess those data, right? So those uh, local data or local cache is usually uh, specific to this uh, computation, right? And then you may have a cache eviction policy to retain the cache a little bit longer. But at the end of the day, I mean, the, those, those the local machines don't really uh, need to possess the data on the disk, right? So, what happened, so one, one, one question is that what would happen if the query execution failed in the middle, right? So we talk about this a little bit uh, when we are discussing a distributed transactional database, right? So in this case, we actually have lots of mechanisms to ensure that, hey, if a node fails, how do we make sure that the data is like uh, still uh, correct, right? How, how do we uh, commit, two-fifth commit, or make sure that a majority of the node commit, and then how do we abort transaction, et cetera, et cetera, right? So um, in, this, in that case, we did discuss lots of details to ensure this distributed transaction is correct and efficient. But in this case, in distributed analytical processing, it's actually kind of a little bit different, right? Because most of those analytical queries, like I mentioned a little bit um, last class and early this class, will actually be read-only, right? Most of the time, they're just scanning through a lots of lots of data and then maybe perform some uh, complicated operations, try to extract knowledge out of it, but not necessarily uh, update or insert new data into it, right? So for most of the analytical queries, we don't actually need to worry about this uh, correctness issue uh, when transaction or query fail. But then one issue does impact a little bit is that those analytical queries typically are long running, right? Because I mean, many times you have to scan a lot of lots of data, even billions of records to extract knowledge out of it. And then by long running, what I mean is that in many cases, in many practical cases, those queries can take hours, right? So if a queries fail, I mean, an analytical query fail in a distributed environment, even though you don't need to worry about the correct issue, but then there will be lots of wasteful work, right? So it also seems, um, again, a little bit wasteful or inefficient that if a I mean, distributed analytical query fail, and then you just, you just waste all the work. So what do people do in practice? So in practice, people actually uh, don't really, uh, usually, right? People actually don't try to uh, save the intermediate result and then recover the query out of failure, even though the query may take a long time. So if I mean, one node uh, of, of this uh, distributed analytical query fail, um, if the query is read-only, then people just uh, simply abort it, right? And then re-execute the query again. So it's mostly just uh, for, again, simplicity and the efficiency of the query for the consideration of simplicity as well as the efficiency of query execution. Because if you want to uh, materialize the intermediate result and try to recover the query back from failure, well, that potentially would be costly, right, if you want to write data to the disk. Also, if one node failed, right, like we discussed uh, in the last class, if this particular node that failed is, happens to be the uh, leader or primary node that is like responsible for aggregating the results, then you actually need to uh, re-elect a new leader, right? You have to do the leader, leader election and then uh, figure out, find out a new master or, or primary node to be responsible for aggregating the results. So all of those mechanisms would potentially be costly. So in practice, uh, people actually usually uh, don't try to uh, log out the results and recover it. That said, uh, there are definitely uh, some systems uh, try to do that, right? Uh, but but usually um, those systems would just uh, do a like a simple lightweight lightweight version. Maybe not necessarily materialize all the intermediate result, but then they uh, just log out some metadata about this query processing, uh, so that uh, when the uh, when if a node fail and sometimes and, and sometime later you uh, spin up a new node that's trying to uh, replace this node, then you may need to actually recompute whatever computation done for that node, but then return the computation for other nodes. Right, something a little bit lighter. Uh, lighter weight that people sometimes do, but it's not that common.
So to quickly illustrate this, right, how you can, one, one potential approach you can do that, then again, a similar example, assume that we have this uh, shared disk architecture and two nodes, right, then this query uh, got sent to the first node, and then, um, like I discussed in the last example, one part of the query will be, uh, will be uh, sent to the second node uh, to be responsible for the execution, and both of them need to, I mean, re either read data or push the query to the disk, right, doesn't really matter for this discussion, but then the, uh, the, in, the, in this uh, model where you want to log some intermediate result, right, in this architecture, after the second node finishes the computation of its portion, I mean, on this join result, it may actually just try to uh, write this um, intermediate or like this partial drawing results back to this uh, shared disk storage, right? And then say later on this second node failed, and then what, what the system could do is that it may realize that, hey, I have uh, finished the computation on the second node on its portion of the join, right? And then instead of trying to recompute it, the first node can directly go to this I mean, shared storage, uh, shared disk uh, layer, and then fetch that result back, and then directly do the aggregation and send back to the client, right? But it's something that um, some systems do. I think, again, Amazon uh, Redshift supports a version of it, but it's, it's, it's like a pretty a lightweight. But uh, usually people uh, just, uh, usually people don't really do it that way. All right? Okay. <laughs> so any questions before we get to query planning? Okay, so query planning. In the distributed uh, system, right, in, in, for, this, uh, for the purpose of this course would be a distributed analytical processing system. I mean, the, most of the query planning techniques we talk about in a single node environment will actually still apply, right? So uh, for example, a predicate push down, I mean, drawing uh, pro uh, early projections of queries as well as uh, optimization on drawing ordering, most of those techniques would still remain the same. Right. So the the biggest difference would actually just be uh, the uh, the cost of sending data over uh, through the network. Right. So essentially, in uh, in a um, in the query optimization of a distributed analytical query, uh, the um, optimizer would need to consider uh, the location of the query and the the, the uh, network cost of uh, sending data over, etc. Right. So that's actually the uh, main difference. So so for the um, mechanism, right, to send different portion of the query. I mean, because after you optimize the query, I mean, you have a query plan, right? So the mechanism to send the different parts of in, in these slide fragments of the query to different machines uh, to execute will actually uh, fall into uh, two categories, right? So the, uh, in the first uh, category, after you uh, optimize a, a distributed query, you may actually send the uh, physical operators in, instead of SQL queries to different nodes uh, in your partition or in your, in your cluster, right? So uh, this would think of them as the um, plan nodes uh, in the uh, third project you did about query execution, right? So this like a physical representative re operator would essentially mean the plan nodes in the plan tree, right? And you can send the different portions um, of the plan nodes in your plan tree to different machines and to responsible for executing a different data. But then there's also a second approach where you actually, uh, I mean, after you I mean, finish this uh, query planning and then generate a uh, physical query plan, you would actually uh, try to regenerate SQL queries, I mean, from those already optimized query plan, right? But then you generate SQL queries that are specifically uh, targeted different partition of the data. Right, that's actually a possible approach as well. And then in that case, the benefit is that you may actually uh, do a second round of query optimization on a different partitions, right? And specifically optimize a, per a portion of the query for the data on a specific partition of node, right? So this the second approach would actually, I mean, it's, it sounds a little bit interesting, but it's obviously is more complicated. It's not used by many systems. And, and as far as I know, uh, there are only two systems that use this, right? For uh, the first is single, single store or previous name, uh, MemCQ. The other is Avertis. So let me uh, use this, quickly use this, right? So uh, in, the, uh, in the second example, right, in the second approach sending a SQL query, again, assume that you have this uh, simple join query, and then I have three different partitions, right, that like, uh, I mean, has data with uh, different ranges. And then with, uh, with the second approach, what you will do is that you will first optimize this uh, first query, like get a query plan. Uh, but then after that, you actually uh, rewrite those or regenerate SQL queries out of its query plan, but targeting different partition, right? So in this case, the three different queries you could generate is that 
with this join, but then you can actually attend this append this where clause. I mean that are responsible for uh, different ranges of values to these different partitions, right? And then you can send queries to each of these uh, different partitions, and then to write to re-optimize them. So the um, benefit of this, I mean, the reason why some systems do it this way is that when you optimize a query, right, you are largely relied on the uh, statistics or metadata of the information or distribution of the data, etc., right? But then those are statistics, right, or the metadata about the data distribution may actually be outdated. I mean, not necessarily you have the most updated data on the uh, primary, uh, I mean, node that is responsible for query execution, right? So when the first time you optimize a query, you may actually not have necessarily have the best query plan for all the executions on these uh, different nodes, uh, given that I mean the data is not really local to you, and you, you may have a stale statistics. So when you send the data, sorry, when you gen generate those uh, new queries and sen then send them to the different machines, they actually have they actually will have the opportunity to reopen them using the information directly available I mean, on the local disk and the most up to up to date statistic. Right. Say for example. For the, on the different machines, you may actually I mean, sort the data differently. Right? On, on one machine, you may sort the data, and then on the other machine, you may not sort it. Then on the machine that the data is actually sorted, you may potentially perform a sort merge join, right? Could, could potentially be more efficient. But on the, on the other, other machine, uh, you may just perform a hash join. And then this way, I mean, the different machines would have the opportunity to optimize them. So it's pretty interesting, but it's a um, little bit complicated. So in the for the most case, right, most of the system, most of the system uh, that I know would actually just uh, use a simple approach where you optimize the query in a central location, but then you just send a different subplans, right, different subtree or the operators of this query uh, to different machines and for the execution. All right. Any question? Cool. So um, of course, I mean, after you finish the execution, you still need to uh, send results back to this uh, central location to aggregate them and send back to the clients, right? Okay. So next, how? So 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 when when you are performing a uh, distributed query, right? So a uh, most naive approach, again, like I mentioned uh, in the earlier example in the class would actually be uh, to aggregate all the data from different partitions and then, I mean, get the data all on a single machine and then perform the join on a single location, right? That's the uh, most naive approach. But obviously, the disadvantage of that approach is that uh, you can, you can, uh, you can, I mean, there is data is very costly to send lots of data over the network. Uh, as well as, I mean, if the, the machine is not, does not have big enough memory, then you have to potentially spill data onto the disk, right? So what we really want in a distributed, I mean, analytical system would actually be uh, executing different partition, different portion of the query on different partitions, especially closer to where the data located, right? And uh, I mean, as I uh, show you, as I sort of like uh, hinted in the earlier examples, one important property that we need to ensure when we try to execute different portions of this query on different partitions is that we need to make sure that, especially, I mean, say there's a join query, we need to make sure that the uh, tuples in these two relations, right, that has the same join key would be executed uh, on the same machine, right? Because otherwise, if you are join uh, two tables or two relations R and S uh, on this um, attribute ID, but then you have, uh, I mean, for the relation R, you have ID equals to five on one machine, but the relation S, you can ID equals to five on a different machine. Then you, if you just don't communicate the data between different machines and naively execute the query on different partitions, then you, you will actually miss this matching between the two tuples. Right, so you, that's the that's what would, the query result would be wrong, and then we need to make sure that that didn't happen, and we always can matching uh, the uh, two posts that would have uh, this uh, same join key together if we perform a distributed join query. Right, so that's what we usually what we need to ensure uh, in a distributed in, in, in a join in a join algorithm on a distributed analytical processing engine, and then um, depending on where the data is located. Right, how the query, where, where you, you try to perform this query, there will be different scenarios and different amount of movements of data that is involved in a distributed join query. And that's what I'm going to get you to next. All right. So uh, there are a couple of scenarios. I mean, they are ranging from uh, either, uh, I mean, 
best case scenario, I mean, um, worst case scenario, or some, something in between, right? Depending on how much data you need to send over different machines. So in one scenario would be one of the best case or like better case scenario would be that uh, one, of, one table would potentially be a partitioned on different machines, but then another table may actually be replicated on all the machines, right? So that's actually not that uncommon, right? Especially with the, um, uh, what's called a star schema, like we discussed earlier in the class, right? If a dimension table is small, right? For example, if one dimension table just stores the uh, location information, the postcodes of, of different cities, for example, right? Then, I mean, that database is actually not that big and doesn't really get updated that often, right? If the postcodes of different, uh, different locations uh, in, in different cities. So in this case, actually in many practical implementation as well, people would actually just replicate the uh, table that contains all the post uh, postcode information on all the machines, right? And in this case, you can directly, I mean, no matter, I mean, whether the other table, how the other table is partitioned, you actually always can be able to directly perform the join on each node because uh, this uh, smaller table is replicated on all the machines. So here, for example, right? Again, a similar, uh, it's a similar uh, simple join query, but then assume that um, this uh, table R or relation R is partitioned with ID um, on different machines, and then you have this uh, relation S that is like a smaller and then replicated on all the machines, right? So uh, in this case, say, I mean, this like left machine has ID one to 100, and then for relation R, then the right machine has the ID 101 to 200. And in this case, because the S table is replicated, so you can always find the matching tuple on, I mean, all the machines, right? No matter uh, which, uh, what ID this uh, tuple from relation R has. So in this case, you can just uh, perform the join in parallel, right, on two different machines, and then later on, you just aggregate the join results to one of the machine and then send the results back to the client, right? So you don't actually need uh, this um, data movement, at least, uh, you don't need to move the data of the original values of the tuples in any of the relations. All right? Cool. So in the uh, next scenario, right? So uh, it's also the one of the best scenario is that the two tables may, may, may both be uh, pretty big, right? You don't, you don't really have the luxury to replicate either of the table on, on, on all the machines, but then potentially you may have the same partition key, right, that as the join key on both of the two relations, right? So in that case, for all the data that resides on a particular node, right, it would contains all the tuples from this uh, join from the relation, um, from both relation that has the both, uh, the same range in terms of this uh, join key, right? So in that case, it's also uh, very uh, straightforward, and you can also similarly perform uh, the join operation locally, on different machines without a direct movement of the original value of the tuple, right? And then aggregate the results together. And in this simple example, right, assuming that the left machine has all the values both from relation R and S from range uh, 1 to 100, and then the right machine, again, 101 to 200, you can just perform the join separately and then aggregate the results on one particular machine and then send the results back to the client, right? Again, it seems a little bit ideal, but it's actually not that uncommon in practice either, right? Because in, in many practical applications, you can, you, you, you would know, I mean, in, in many cases, right, you would know what roughly what type of queries that users may issue. You can look at the history of queries, et cetera, and then you can sort of design the partition scheme of your distributed database that can be the most beneficial to the uh, common queries, right, in the, in the, in, in the workload. And then, I mean, in this case, if you notice that there are many join queries on the same key, then you can just partition it that way, right? It's actually not that uncommon either. All right, make sense? Okay. So the next example, right, uh, not so ideal, right? Not the worst case yet, but not so ideal, <laughs> is that when you uh, perform this join, right? So again, assume that no, not, uh, like, there's no table that if you can have uh, both of the, uh, what's called, um, no table that, are, that, that is small enough that you can replicate the entire table on the entire machines, on all the machines. But then, I mean, you, didn't have, you are not lucky enough to have the same partition either, right? But then assume that you have uh, one table that is partitioned uh, with the join key, right, that is required. But then in this case, for example, would be R, right, I, relation R partitioned on ID. But then you have the other relation, right, just unfortunately partitioned on a different key or attribute, for example, value, right? Then in this case, I mean, again, for the R, it's, it's the same partition, but then for the S, for the relation S, even though you know that 
hey, relation S may be partitioned based on this value attribute with ID 1 to 50 on the left and the other on the right, but then you, you don't know what their ID is. Their ID could be 1, could be 100, could be 200. You just don't know, right? So in this case, you just can't naively just perform the drawing uh, separately or individually on these two, two different machines. So what do you have to do here? In here, you just have to <laughs> copy the data for the relation from the relation that does not have the drawing key right, to this uh, each of this node. So in this here, you have to copy the uh, value from uh, table relation S from the left table to the right, right, to, to perform this join on the ID 101 to 200. But similarly, you just have to copy the value from the right machine, I mean, from the relation S to the left machine as well. Right, because you just don't know what would be the uh, ID of this uh, relation S onto the two different machines. Right? So in this case, you just have to make a copy in this case in, in both uh, on both machines with relation S and then perform the drawing on relation R. Right? But then you can perform drawing separately and finally send results back to the client. All right? Yes, please. Oh, it's, yeah, that is a good question. So uh, here in, the, in this example, as I illustrated, it's because it's partitioned on something unrelated, right? So uh, you just have to, you just have to uh, make the copy and in, in both direction, right? Uh, but I mean, you, you're actually uh, correct that in some cases, right, if you recognize that, hey, one relation is particularly small, Right. Even though um, one relation is partitioned, the other is not, but then if one relation is particularly small, right, for example, R in this case, right, you can also choose to copy R. Right? I mean, you can do that. Right? But for in this example I showed, it's because it's partitioned on the unrelated key. Right? Cool. <laughs> and then uh, in the last scenario, right, which would be the worst case scenario, that none of the uh, relation is partitioned I mean, on, on the uh, join key. Right? In this case, you just have to I mean, it's called a shuffling, right? Oh, by the way, <laughs> I forgot to mention, for this scenario three, this is called a broadcasting scenario, right? Or sometimes referred as a broadcast join, right? And just broadcast, right? That's the, actually the uh, term, a standard term to describe this type of, um, type of uh, distributed join algorithm, right? Because it is broadcasting one relation to all the other uh, partitions. And then the last scenario, right? Assuming that you just, uh, I mean, unfortunately, uh, don't have either table partitioned based on the join key, so you just do a, a reshuffle, right? Or in, in like a more uh, common terminology, it's called a shuffling of the data, right? Or shuffle join, right? It's like all oh, same thing, right? To uh, re essentially, it's, it's you have to rearrange the data or repartition the data across different machines, right? See here in this example, right? You have this two relation drawing on this ID, but none of them has the uh, partition key as the join key. Then you have to um, reshuffle or repartition the both relations, right? In this case, for relation R, you have to I mean, I mean, move the data uh, for relation R with ID 101 to 200 on this machine and, and uh, 1 to 100 on the other machine. But similarly, with relation S, you have to do the same thing, right? You have to do, move the, uh, all the records in, in, in relation S with ID 101 to 200 on this machine and then the um, other records on the different machine. And then you come back to the second scenario, right? where this uh, data would be partitioned based on the join key. And then you can perform the uh, drawing operation on, on different partitions, and then finally aggregate the results. All right, make sense? Yes. So in the previous scenario three, were we copying all the table X, or just the X with the relevant IDs? Oh, yeah, in this case, it would be uh, entries with relevant IDs, sorry. Yeah, 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 sorry, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I didn't, didn't really uh, uh, use it here. Okay, so uh, one thing I want to note that there's actually a uh, special case of those uh, drawing queries would be called a semi-drawing query. So uh, this is a um, this is referred to a type of query where I mean obviously you are performing a drawing, but after the, you perform the drawing, you actually only require data from one side of the relation. Right? You actually don't really need. Uh, any records from a different uh, relation or any value from the tuples on a different relation. So for this particular type, this is actually not a CQ standard, right? Just like a, a category of query with potential optimization, right? So for this particular type of query, 
just actually the opportunity, right, that you don't actually send the uh, data of um, all the attributes all on the on the on one uh, relation, right, when you actually need to uh, shuffle the data to uh, reduce the uh, network overhead, right? Because I mean, for this query, uh, they only need uh, data from one uh, particular relation, right? So this is a specific example here, right? Say you have this again, the same uh, join query, right? Join uh, table R and S. But then you, at the end of the day, after the join, you only need uh, this, uh, some attributes from relation R, right? In this case, for simplicity, just the ID from R, right? So what you can do here is that, again, assuming that they have these uh, two relation R and S, uh, just for simplicity, right? Just assume that they are on uh, different machines. So here, I mean, in order to perform this join, you have to move data around, right? For here, for example, we want to, let's say we want to, we need to move uh, the tuple uh, from R, from S to R. But in this case, Instead of moving like all this um, entire tuple, you would actually only need to move the record ID of all the relation from all the tuples in relation S to a different machine, right? Similarly, right, you when you try if you assuming that you have to reshuffle the data, assuming that you have to move data from left machine to right machine, you only need to move move the IDs of those records to the right machine, right? Because I mean the join operation actually doesn't need any computation based on the uh, specific values. I mean in collaboration or yeah, in collaboration of these two tables, right? So in this case, after you send the particular value of this like a table, table sorry, after you send the IDs of all the tuples in, uh, from this table R uh, on the left to right, you can actually just directly check, hey, whether I have a match there, right? If I have a match, then I record the ID. If I don't have a match, then I throw that away, right? And then after you finish the join, I mean, similarly, you only need to send the IDs of those matching tuple back to the uh, I mean right, nodes on the on the left, right? And then this and after after that you can perform whatever remaining operation that can do the projection or do some calculation based on the values on the, in the R relation, right? Because again, because this query does not need any actual value from the other table. Right? This would just type of query would just be called a semi join, and then the system would actually do the corresponding optimization for this specific type of query. So some some system would actually uh, support this semantics of a semi join, uh, but it's not in SQL standard. So some system don't actually uh, uh, I mean support this semantics. And in that case, many system would actually use the uh, exist clause uh, to rewrite this query and then fake this uh, semi join semantics. Right? For example, in this case, right, this, the above query could be written to a query that you 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 select all the IDs from R, but you check whether uh, there exists a, a particular tuple in the S relation that has this uh, matching ID. Right? In this case, it's a semi uh, semantics for this semi join. All right. Any question for this? Okay. Yeah. I mean, in this case, yeah, you just directly send the ID, and then uh, I mean, after after you finish semi join, you send the ID back, right? As you see here. Okay. So uh, the uh, last topic, right? So uh, we have finished all the uh, high level, again, there are many detailed optimizations uh, with uh, distributed analytical database, but for the purpose of this class, we only focus in on the uh, high level ideas and intuitions, right? So before I give you uh, more examples of the uh, modern cloud databases, any uh, remaining question about uh, uh, distributed analytical system? No? Okay, so just the last topic, right? Give you some uh, examples of uh, cloud system, right? To finish the topic of in this course. So, like I mentioned, many of the uh, modern systems or modern distributed database system will actually uh, move into the cloud, right? To give um, the users more flexibility and more convenience to uh, deploy their uh, data application, right? So, uh, in this case, I mean, m many of these systems, like I mentioned before, even though Many of the newer systems would generally use a uh, shared disk architecture, but as I mentioned uh, in the uh, uh, data, data push and pull example before, some of the systems would actually just blur the line between shared disk and shared nothing, right? So in, in some, sometimes, even though you have a shared disk architecture, like I mentioned, you may still push some some part some part part of the queries to this shared disk layer and perform some simple filtering, filtering etc., and then uh, trying to be as efficient as as possible, right? And that is possible, especially because I mean, many of these um, 
a cloud database vendors, if you will, they have the control of the whole stack, right? Amazon, for example, they build their uh, distributed database, right? For example, Aurora or Redshift, but then they also have control to their storage service, S3, right? And then it is very, I mean, convenient for them to install I mean, or extend some additional functionality on S3, which would be the shared disk, right? In collaboration with the distributed database layer, right? To maximize the system performance. So generally, there are two types of cloud database systems that you uh, may have heard of. I don't know how familiar you are with those terms. Terms. One type of system would be called uh, managed database systems. Right? Uh, but by the way, those are not super like a strict um, textbook definition. Right? It's like a general ca general uh, categorization of a system that people has. But they are not like I mean, sometimes the which which category a system exactly belongs to is not uh, super clear. Right? But generally. The first type would be called managed database systems, right? Those would be typically referred to the database system uh, that, that are not like specifically modified for the cloud environment, right? They're just a whatever original um, uh, design for the uh, either single node or distributed system, right? But whatever original design for their on-prem version, they just run them uh, in the cloud. Right. And then uh, they just uh, let the cloud provider, instead of you uh, trying to um, manage your own data center, right, to trying to uh, deal with those machines, keep them running, you let the cloud to manage, to cloud providers to manage the machines in the data center or in your cluster for you, right? But then you are still running the same software, or the same database as you are running in a uh, on-premise setting, right? So those, those will be called managed database services, right? This is actually support supported by uh, most of the cloud vendors, right? For example, in, uh, in Amazon, it's called Amazon RDS, right? I'm Amazon Relational Database Service. I think that's the full name. And then they offer uh, their cloud, their, their version, managed version of Postgres, MySQL, et cetera. It's just the same software, right? It's just that the cloud vendor runs the cluster for you. But then the second type would be usually referred to as cloud native database management system, right? Those are typically referred to the database system that are designed from ground up, right? That are specifically designed for a uh, cloud environment. And typically they, are, they, are, they use this uh, shared disk architecture because again, cloud typically provide this uh, convenient uh, and flexible uh, shared disk service, right? For such as Amazon S3. Um, and then they will, they will have uh, specific organizations designed in this environment, right? Those systems will be referred to as a cloud native database system. And there are many examples for that, right? Snowflake would be a very uh, famous example for that, but also uh, Google BigQuery, Amazon Redshift, and also um, uh, Microsoft Azure, uh, SQL Azure. But for the uh, later, later two examples, it's actually kind of interesting because for the later two examples, they actually start as a uh, managed, managed, as managed DB, the database system services in the cloud, right? So when Amazon first built uh, Redshift or Azure, they're actually using uh, some existing uh, techniques and built on, on prem. And in the Redshift scenario, I think they bought a existing uh, distributed analytical company, right? And then I mean, just uh, I mean, uh, put it on top of their uh, Amazon cloud. And then in the uh, SQL Server uh, Azure example, right? They just put their original uh, SQL Server I mean, managed by the uh, Azure cloud, right? So this initially they are all management managed uh, database system services, but then uh, later on, because I mean they are in the cloud, right? And then they control the software, and it's kind of oblivious to the users, right? So just to keep updating the system and keep changing, changing it, optimizing it, and eventually it actually became um, different enough. Uh, than the original version, right? So nowadays we just call them a uh, cloud native database system, right? But it actually did not start as cloud native uh, to begin with, all right? So another type of database system, okay, uh, the, to, to not to, not to confuse you guys more, but another type of database system uh, in the cloud that you often see would be called serverless database system, right? So by serverless, it doesn't really mean that there's just no server. Uh, because, I mean, you have to have a server to run any uh, sys database system, right? So by serverless, it actually usually is most mean uh, refers to as a uh, pricing model, where you actually don't necessarily have a dedicated, uh, designated compute node uh, for your database system, right? Instead, what you do is that typically it's a shared disk architecture, right? Typically, you have the, your, your disk that is always there, but then you will actually 
only have the compute node being uh, like um, executed, be and uh, being uh, spin up when you execute query against the system, right? And then you are only you as a user, right, would only be charged for the amount of uh, computation resources, amount of time where you execute that query for the on, on the compute node, right? If you if your the system is idle, right, don't execute anything, you actually only be charged by the storage, I mean, which would potentially be much cheaper than the uh, CPU and memory cost, right? So in this case, you actually would save, um, potentially save money uh, when you don't need the system, right? So this is like a called serverless. It's like a, as if there's a no designated server uh, that is uh, uh, you, you, you allocate for you, right? But you only uh, have the server uh, when you need to execute queries, right? So here, right, in this example, right, say uh, I have this application server, right? I have this, uh, I mean, computer node on the side, let me see that, I mean, I, I, right now I, have, I want to perform some queries, right, and then I exchange with the system, and then I got billed, right, got charged by the amount of computational resource when I'm executing queries on this service database, right. And then, for example, right, I, I go to sleep, I go to rest, and then I, for some reason, the database system, I don't need to execute queries on the database system for now, right. So then what happened is that in order to uh, save uh, money, I mean, in this case, I mean, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the in the simple case, right, if you have a designate, designated uh, node for your system, then you will be charged by, even though you are, you are the system is actually idle, you're not executing anything, right? So that would be the uh, earlier example with the uh, managed database service, all the uh, traditional, I mean, even though it's cloud native, but the traditional pricing model, right? But then in the serverless world, right, what's different is that, again, typically it will be the, uh, they call it shared disk architecture, right? Because it's very difficult to do this in a shared nothing architecture, right? It's almost impossible, right? So you typically it's a shared disk architecture. What you would do is that you are, again, similar to the earlier example, when you have some queries to execute, you will go through this compute node, right? Executing them and then getting data from the disk, et cetera, et cetera, send the results back to the client. But now, say if you, are, you go to sleep, you have a rest, what happens is that the system could choose to write that the, all the content in your buffer pool back to this uh, shared uh, storage, right? And then just directly shut the middle node, the middle computer node down, right? So that you don't actually need to reserve this node anymore, and you are going to not going to be charged by the CPU and the memory for this node, which would be much more expensive than the storage, right? It's like, so this storage would be uh, much cheaper. And later on, say that you come back and you, you want to execute some additional queries, I mean, you can just read this uh, buffer pool, the buffer pool uh, page table, back from this shared storage and then repopulate the database, right? So in this case, you don't, you don't need to have a, a code cache, right? You just have whatever cached content uh, in your buffer pool, I mean, originally, I mean, last time you log off, and then the system would pretend, will give you an illusion that you just, uh, the system is always running, even though it doesn't have a de 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 designated um, compute server for it, right? So that's called a serverless, and potentially is like a much more flexible, and then uh, you may save money if, if you, uh, your system has lots of idle time or downtime, right? So uh, many uh, cloud, system, cloud system vendors will support this. For example, Amazon, Fauna, uh, CQ Azure, uh, Microsoft CQ Azure, as well as Google BigQuery. Right? Many BigQuery would, would be uh, coming next month. I don't know whether they will talk about service or not, but potentially. Right? Many systems will actually support this uh, newer model as well. It's kind of like um, becoming, becoming more, more popular these days. All right? Cool. So uh, next thing interesting I want to mention a little bit, right? <laughs> Again, this is like a, a more a general discussion, right? It is not like too deep into the technical details. But one another interesting thing that people do these days is that uh, other than uh, try to build all these components by ourselves in a giant uh, system, right? Build the catalog, build the optimizer, uh, build the uh, cluster management layer. One approach to build a uh, distributed database, especially coming in the cloud, is actually to leverage lots of these uh, existing um, tools, right, all the uh, services in the cloud uh, to build a um, disaggregated uh, distributed database system, if you will, right? So for example, uh, in, uh, for the catalog, there are lots of uh, these uh, existing catalog management services in different cloud, right? Google has this uh, Google Data Cloud service, and Amazon has this Amazon Glue Data Catalog. So instead of having their own, like, a customized in-house catalog service, right, similar to Amazon distributed database have this Amazon S3 as a shared disk layer. Your Amazon, the Amazon, if you want to build a distributed database in Amazon, 
you can even use this uh, Amazon Glue Data Service, right? And then uh, similar to this, um, similar, similarly, right? You for the node management, right? This like a commit protocols, replication protocol, etc. You can use Kubernetes or Apache Yarn. Yarn Right, there are many uh, existing services as well. And also uh, for the query optimizations, right, there are even uh, these like open source query optimizers uh, that you can use as a query optimization service, right, such as uh, Greenplum uh, Orca or as well as uh, Apache Kale Site. Right? And then uh, with those services, there are two ben benefits essentially, essentially right? The, the first benefit is that it's, it's easier, right? It's, it's simpler to um, build a, um, Build a database system, I mean, especially a distributed database system, leveraging uh, all those existing uh, services in the cloud, right? The, but the second benefit is that your system may actually need even be able to share components with other uh, systems, right? For example, uh, take the uh, take the um, Amazon S3 example again, right? If you build your distributed database using Amazon S3 as the shared disk. Then not only that, I mean, it's simpler to I mean write your distributed system, but also with this shared data stored on S3, you can actually expose your data to other services, right? Not only your distributed database can can use the data on S3. If there's some other um, analytical tools or, or even some machine learning applications need to read the data, not not, not necessarily need to compute it by a regional database, then you potentially can be able to read data there as well, right? By using those shared services. So uh, this is another uh, potential uh, strategy to build a system. But of course, uh, typically, right, with these uh, general purpose uh, data services, uh, you may not be able to fully utilize the software and optimize the system as efficient as, as you want. Right? So that's the uh, disadvantage uh, there because you are using those general purpose software. But this is one approach you can take. All right. So uh, lastly, right, there are, there are some um, some universal, I mean, similar to there are, there are universal or general purpose uh, uh, tools for you to uh, build uh, data services or distributed database. There are also uh, many universal data formats that you can choose nowadays, right? Try to uh, share the data and then make the system to support uh, more applications, right? So uh, traditionally, right, again, typically a database system would have their, like they have their own customized uh, catalog management, uh, commit protocol, etc. Usually, database system would have their own customized data formats as well, right? Uh, for example, uh, I think in your in your first uh, class, I mean in BusTab, sorry, in your first project in BusTab, you have this um, customized uh, page layout, right? That's specifically for BusTab. And then, if you want to move data between uh, different databases, or if you want to ex export that data to some uh, machine learning applications you actually have to do a transformation of the data first, right? Transform data into a CSV format, a JSON format, et cetera, et cetera. And then that could potentially be costly. So one uh, thing that some people do nowadays is that, I mean, instead of using this specifically highly customized data format, you can actually potentially choose a open source data format, right? There are many popular choices of them um, as the data format of your system, right? Then you can actually uh, be much easier to move data around different databases and then uh, uh, try to uh, support other applications with your data, right? But, but, but by using this data format, I, I, I don't necessarily mean that you have to store your data exactly uh, in the format of this open source specification, right? You could actually, there are different choices. One choice is to, I mean, you directly store the data this way by right, using these like uh, many open formats. The other choice is that you can actually still store your data in your own format, right? But then you could provide mechanism or functionality to efficiently tra translate your internal data format to a open source format, right? And then it's easier, again, for people to move data around different systems or support other applications, right? So there are many of those open data formats nowadays. Uh, one, the more popular one would actually probably be um, Apache uh, uh, Parquet. That's uh, from a cloud, from a collaboration uh, in uh, the Twitter, a cloud era, a few companies. And then the um, Orca format is actually uh, pretty popular as well, right? That's uh, from um, Apache Hive. And there are also other, other this kind of these uh, formats from uh, different places, right? Uh, uh, this like carbon data from Huawei, Iceberg from Netflix. And then uh, this HDF file is also kind of interesting. It's, it's, it's not actually that common used 
in a database system, but it's actually also pretty common used in high-performance computing world, right? It's a, like a multi-dimensional array, and it's really used to compute, I um, think for this like a super machine to compute the trajectory of uh, some physical problem, et cetera, right? And then lastly, uh, arrow format is actually also um, getting more attention these days, I would say. Uh, it's like, like an in-memory uh, execution format, but it's actually uh, came, out, came out from this uh, original uh, inventor from the uh, Pandas library, right, which is actually uh, used uh, very common uh, in, uh, in data scientists, uh, data science world. And then they have this open format called Apache Arrow as well. And uh, I mean, many systems would actually uh, support that uh, to, again, to, to, make, to make, make the data movement uh, much easier, right? And actually, besides, Either just like I mean, this is, since this is the last slide, right? Just uh, just mention a little bit more is that besides either you uh, directly store for, uh, your data as this format, or you just uh, provide a transformation, an internal transformation mechanism. Another choice is that you could actually try to uh, tweak those formats a little bit, right? You can you can one of the uh, the, uh, the uh, system that we build at CMU, the knowledge based system, is actually pretty much based on the arrow format, but it's a little bit different, right? So it's like a tweak of the arrow format, if you will, to support many of the uh, relational database functionalities that we want. But then, because our format is very close to the arrow format, right? So besides supporting the regular functionalities, we actually can easily uh, transform our format to arrow as well, right? So we make this data movement uh, very efficient, all right? So that's uh, all I, I the, all the content I have today. Right? Again, to so give you uh, many examples of this uh, cloud uh, analytical database, analytical processing database uh, vendor. And then the way to think about them is that for those analytical databases, right, when you start an application, you, you know, when you start to building a, like a small company, like a small application, you may not necessarily need those like a heavy lifting, uh, high end, uh, distributed analytical systems, right? But when your system, when your company or, or, or your or organization grow in size, right, when you have uh, more and more data, now you may have the, the need to uh, perform analytics on like this like a large amount of data and trying to extract intelligence, right? Trying to uh, make data, make informed decision based on this information with your data. And then that may potentially generating loss of business value, right? So usually it's only that when your data are large enough, right? So you tr try to start to uh, resolve to these uh, high-end analytical uh, Processing engines, and usually uh, these are like a, just you perform a very like a business critical uh, decisions with these systems, and then they have many uh, potential uh, potential benefit of those uh, potential financial benefit of those decisions, right? So people are also paying a lot of money to this system and store lots of data, and then there are lots of organizations uh, that are people are putting into uh, to this system, right? All right, so that's all I have uh, today, and then next class we'll have the uh, guest speaker from Google talk about. BigQuery, right? It's like one of these examples of a cloud distributed database system. And again, we have we need attendance uh, on this course, and I will pay on, on the guest lecture, and I will post more details on Piazza. Thank you. About the St. Ives Brew, run through a can or two. Share with my crew is magnificent, plus it's mellow. And for the rest of the commercial, I pass the mic on to my no fellow. For a mic check, bust it. The fuse all set, then grab a 40. The from New York and snap his neck. St. Ives, take a sip, then wipe your lips. Cue my 40's getting warm. I'm out, he got the dip. Drink it, drink it, drink it, then I burp. After I slurp, ice cube, I put in much work. With the BMT and the E-Trouble, get us a St. Ives Brew on the double.